I'm Sally Davis. I'm a queer defence analyst. My name is Paul Strong and I'm a military historian. And this is Queeros, a brief history of LGBT and gender nonconformity in the military. Sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression are different independent things. So we're going to be talking about gay men, lesbians and bisexuals. We're also going to talk about trans people and non-binary people. And also a lot of straight people or gender non-conforming people who don't fit the cultural rules about what it means to be a man or a woman in society. Uh, and that covers a huge space of gay and straight and transgender. And it's also something that changes over time. So in the 17th century, men wore stockings and heels and that was considered masculine. These days, that would probably be considered trans or queer. Uh, and it also covers things like women having a mind of their own and expecting to have a career outside of the two world wars. This was hugely outside of gender normative behavior until fairly recently. Uh, so how do we know all these people are queer? The answer is we kind of don't. It's really hard to tell and hard to see them in the historical record because coming out was not an option then the way it is today. And history is written by straight white men who often aren't interested in documenting queeros as being queer. So even when people have lived openly gay or trans lives, the historical account gets sanitized and that bit gets left out. So it's mostly the noisy stuff that's visible, the really fabulous men or the lesbian footballers. So all these stereotypes exist for a reason. And this lecture is going to be full of those stereotypes, but hopefully also blow those stereotypes apart. A bit of a mature content warning. Paul has a slightly risque picture of Greek art. He's going to cover the ancient world and I will take over for the 20th century. As hinted to by Sally in the introduction, we need to understand the way in which people were perceived across gender, across culture in the past. We often assume that change or progress is linear, that basically it changes towards from a negative position to a positive position. The reality is we're actually returning to what was considered the standard in the past. The impression today is actually taken from the Middle Ages to the 1950s. If you go to the ancient past, it is very different. The principal hero of Greek mythology, the greatest warrior, the greatest fighter, the most skilled swordsman, is Achilles, and Achilles was bisexual. There is no doubt about that. It is very clear in the mythology. His two lovers, Briseis and Patroclus, are key figures in the mythology. His relationship with them is all about passion, about fervor, about love, and no one in Greece would have questioned that or judged it in any way. So it is very much a modern view, a changing modern view, that we see today. If you look at other cultures, that is also true. The Aztecs had their own gods who had these behaviors, and again, this was applauded or seen as a normal behavior, a totally acceptable behavior, or even lauded by society. And we shouldn't find ourselves being caught up in assumptions from an, a very ref, refined small period of history. If you look at the, the deeper mythology, not dealing with human heroes, but with the gods themselves, we find the same parameters. Loki, for example, in North mythology, changes sex several times and even bears children, very definitely gender fluid. Thor, in one of the most famous myths, uh, is actually trying to rescue Freya from potential marriage to the giants and dresses of Freya. Uh, um, dressing in bridal gown with a veil uh, um, in disguise as a goddess to enable him to sneak into the giant's lair and enable Loki then to trick the giants into allowing him to retrieve his famous magical hammer and then to punish for them for their, for, for their transgressions, i.e. betrayal and bullying Freya into marriage. If you look deeper into the mythology, you also find that alternative gender views include the way in which women were viewed in combat, for example. In much earlier history, there's a very strong element in mythology, particularly in Sumerian, Greek, Irish, and Norse mythology, that women were seen as those who trained you in the first phase of combat. You learned skill, skill at arms, you learn it off a woman. So in uh, the, the legend of Cuculan, Cuculan in Ireland, it is Scathak who teaches Cuculan how to wield his sword more effectively. As he gets bigger and stronger, he acquires different skills. But they recognize that skill in arms was best taught by someone who understand, 
understood the finesse of using the weaponry. And this is something which is ascribed to women. And as we'll see later, in other cultures, women often wield weapons in combat, but they tend to be of the finesse variety rather than the heavier weapons of long periods of heavy combat and battle. But they're still ascribed great skill and great effectiveness. This is particularly true when you look again at the broader history. We find that many cultures, the acceptance of alternative gender positions, gender roles, and of homosexuality are considered acceptable. That is how the world works. The Scythians, the, the two top pictures in this, uh, this particular illustration, are um, at, described in Herodotus had not just a view of homosexuality being reasonably acceptable, they also, the transgender community appears. There was an entire tribe described in Herodotus who were seen as the, the diplomats, uh, the, the, the guides, the mentors, judges, because they were seen as bridging two sexes and they were seen as understanding both. And as a result, were enormously influential. Women within Scythian society were expected to have very powerful roles. And Queen Tomaris destroyed Cyrus the Younger in the invasion of Persia. And in the Masagatai, one of the largest of the tribes, uh, women were expected to kill a man or defeat him in battle to actually qualify for marriage, which is why when the Greeks came across the Scythians, they encountered entire groups of women who were operating as reconnaissance and scouts for the Scythian army and assumed they were a separate tribe using the term Amazons to describe them. So this is a, a reality now proven by a considerable number of archeological digs in the Caucasus and Southern Russia, which demonstrate that armed women, skilled combat specialists did exist. And interestingly, many of them after they married obviously settled down, but they still wanted to be buried with their weapons. A few of them clearly continued as warriors and never married and decided to retain that position. And these were highly regarded fighters. As you see by the bottom pictures, all of those cultures, whether it's ancient Rome, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the Minoan civilization, whether it's ancient Egypt, or even early Islam, there was an acceptance of a relationship between individuals, which again, in later periods of history would have been condemned, but was seen as, again, acceptable and lauded in those societies. One particularly good example is ancient Greece. Here is a very good quote, and I make no apology for having a massive text on the slide because it's very important. Here, Plato is talking about homosexuality and democracy. He's talking about the fact that it is about freedom, that it's about love, that it's about friendship. And these are absolutely essential to the very nature of freedom and democracy. And therefore he says that autocracies, despots, will hate these ideas and will try to criticize, marginalize, and crush them. And it is interesting to note that many of the modern autocracies confirm Plato's assumption and that societies that are particularly are, um, anti-homosexuality in particular have a tendency to be the ones that are least keen on democracy. So arguably after 2000 years, Plato is still correct. And these things should be seen as related. You know, there was definitely a, 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 a link between the two that perhaps we should better understand. Another example of this, of the Greeks highlighting the importance of homosexuality in particular is the role of the sacred band. Within uh, um, Greek history, we always talk about Athens and Sparta most commonly, but we don't talk about the state that defeated Sparta. Now, basically, the Thebans were an important city in, 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 the, in the Greek peninsula. They rose in power in the fourth century and eventually came into conflict with the major land power, uh, Sparta. Sparta, by this stage, had, had already marginalized Athens and was the ascendant power. But to their surprise, they found themselves up against a very skilled commander, and his elite force was the Sacred Band. The Sacred Band was made up of a, a larger force of about a thousand, but the, the core of it were 150 paired lovers. Men who loved each other so much, they were seen as being more effective in battle than conventional soldiers. And for a period, they were the most devastatingly effective force in the world. They were finally destroyed by Alexander's father, Philip of Macedon. And of course, the tragedy of the relationship between lovers and battle is that, of course, they will not abandon each other if it goes wrong. So as a result, uh, when, they're, when they finally meet Philip of Macedon, the entire force is killed to the last man. So they get lost by history. 
But during that entire period, again, the Greeks would have not have condemned them or judged them in any way. They would have seen a would have been seen as great warriors, as examples to be followed, examples that we should celebrate. And I think we need to go back into history and understand this and recognize the way in which they were seen at the time. Alexander, another example. The, the historical record confirms that he was almost certainly bisexual. I would argue he was actually omnisexual in terms of he basically loved everything around him. He loved life itself, and his desire to conquer the world was an expression of this passion. The uh, picture of Hephaestion, uh, his most famous uh, um, uh, companion, basically is based on statues of the period. And this particular uh, computer generation, and I'd like to acknowledge the artist, but I don't know his name, is a reconstruction of one of how the statues would have looked at the time, because they were often painted, but also given the way it's been done, it's pretty close to a photograph of a living human being from that period. So it's a truly fascinating moment to actually see that image. And as you can see, it's a very good looking young man. Alexander adored him and named cities after him. But Roxanne, his, uh, um, uh, his Afghan girl, his, his wife, his, his, his queen, basically, also very close to and clearly loved, and Thalestris, a Scythian queen, who turned up and uh, briefly seduced him. Uh, um, so clearly he was open to all ideas. Uh, uh, but Alexander, again, no one would have criticized him for any of this. Again, it, it was part of his nature and something that people celebrated, understood, recognized, and acknowledged. Rome was subtly different. They saw the Greeks as having failed in some way, and they didn't criticize homosexuality strictly for part of that failure. They recognized that all sexuality, in their view, was a weakness. Uh, to love your wife was seen as a little bit strange, uh, um, and they, they had a very mechanical view about interrelationships. While friendship in battle and efficiency in war and political relationships were important, they saw love as something that basically undermined your ability to be effective and to be powerful. And both men and women saw it as basically a hobby something that you should not spend your, your true passions upon. You should be building bridges, conquering states, acquiring power for your family your, and, and, the, and the wider state, the Senate and the people of Rome. And therefore it was seen as inappropriate. And it's very interesting how this Puritanism is one of the things that made the Romans powerful. Unfortunately, it contributes to the next stage in the process. Interestingly, when somebody was overtly homosexual, it obviously had a, a very different impact. Uh, um, it, it was accepted as that person's behavior, and basically everyone just assumed that was how that person was going to operate. And as long as it didn't affect their ability to operate as a Roman ruler or a Roman leader, it was applauded. So Hadrian, for example, very clearly homosexual. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the picture on the bottom right there is again a statue of the individual. It's pity it's not colorized, but you get a very strong impression of how, how this individual might have looked at the time. Hadrian adored him. Unfortunately, he didn't adore his wife, uh, which is why their divorce case is one of the most spectacular in Roman history and involved 50 senators, uh, um, including the future historian Suetonius, who we get much of the information from. So Hadrian very definitely obviously had to marry to have children, uh, but clearly didn't see that as an important relationship in his life. And uh, she naturally uh, um, was un very unhappy about that relationship. But his homosexuality, while some condemned it, it, because it didn't affect his ability to rule, it was not seen as a bad thing for the empire. The problem arises with Christianity. And this is not a criticism of that religion in any way. It obviously, there's a whole set of beliefs, and particularly in the New Testament, which are very open-minded, which are very embracing of all of culture, which recognize that different people have different lifestyles. But the problem is there are letters that are misunderstood. St. Paul's letters particularly have over, half, over harsh interpretation, and they're more about the disruption of community. They're not about a specific condemnation of homosexuality or of female behaviors. So there are various things he said that if that disrupts, don't, don't let women attend that event, or if that disrupts, don't let men of that particular behavior at attend, and therefore they're criticized. Unfortunately, if you combine this with Leviticus in the Old Testament, this gets pretty harsh indeed. And therefore, as a result, gradually Christianity becomes increasingly opposed to particular gender you know, behaviors, particular roles. 
Unfortunately, this is also undermined by the fact that the two most notorious bisexuals, gender fluid characters, is very difficult to ascribe to ancient people, but we do know they were clearly not heterosexual, are incredibly bad examples. Uh, Caligula and Nero were utterly ruthless, utterly evil, and were perfectly happy to persecute anyone who opposed them or anyone who criticized the way in which they operated. And unfortunately, if you look at St. Paul's letters in the context, he's actually criticizing Nero. He's not criticizing homosexuals throughout history. Unfortunately, if you read the letters a few hundred years later, it looks like a more general criticism. It looks like St. Paul is criticizing these individuals. In fact, he's talking about Nero and Nero was evil. We have to understand that, we have to recognize that, and unfortunately, his reputation cast a long shadow on the rest of the Middle Ages. As a result, a sequence of Christian emperors in the later period, Valentinian, Theodosius, Arcadius, all talk about the idea of this being an evil act, and particularly interestingly, the person acting the part of a woman. So as a result, all of those who do this should be publicly burned. And interestingly, when the Templars are destroyed in the 14th century, one of the central accusations is of sodomy and of homosexuality. And as a result, they are burned at the stake, uh, an utterly savage way uh, to execute individuals. But again, like the Roman example, when people are in positions of power, and they are capable of operating effectively, they tend not to be criticized for that. It's merely seen as unusual. William Rufus, almost certainly bisexual. There are plenty of stories in chasing both boys and girls. He was particularly keen on strapping uh, um, girls when he did choose a, a, a female example, but almost certainly uh, um, had lovers of both kinds, eventually assassinated, but he was a very effective ruler. Edward II is a slightly different case. Unfortunately, the association with homosexuality and rebellion, both social and political, and with heresy, of course, meant that when he started to fail, particularly when his association with his lovers undermined the medieval state in England, that meant it was then tainted by that association. So it is not the act itself, it is the fact that it is someone who is weak, ineffectual, and a bad ruler. So William Rufus, it's not a problem. Edward II, it's an enormous problem. And interestingly, we tend to talk about the latter more. We don't talk about the successful examples who were not condemned, but we do tend, particularly in the Victorian period, highlight, and probably this is a residual effect of that Roman Puritan Puritanism, that Christian criticism, combined with this political view that it is rebellious and undermines society, and that leads to this presumption that this is bad. The decisive shift happens with the Renaissance. This is a, an opening of the Western mind. It is the beginning of the liberation of the mind, particularly in the aftermath of the Black Death and the massive influx of Greek and Roman writing returning to the West from the Arab world after the Crusades. Inevitably, you're going to get a shift in social perception. And interestingly, you look at some of the key figures in the Renaissance, they were almost certainly bisexual or homosexual. Uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci are particularly famous examples. Both of them were great artists, both were brilliant military engineers, both contributed to the design of new weapons and the design of new fortifications. Both of them obviously had a reputation in this area, but neither were heavily condemned for it, and both of them were patronized and in a most positive way by powerful rulers and by powerful governments for having very important skills. And the people were beginning to change the way in which they saw certain types of human interrelation. They're beginning, particularly in the arts, to be seen as almost part of that rebellion with the creativity that created it. So it was started being embraced again after a centuries of being seen as a negative, a questionable, rebellious attitude. A very spectacular example of another culture, where I think we need to understand this, is Japan. In Japan, uh, for centuries, there had been a gradiated approach in which where affection was measured. Like the Romans, the, Japan, the Japanese samurai were highly uh, uh, 
controlled in the way in which they saw love and affection. They saw it as something that essentially uh, hinted at weakness. There's one very famous example of a Japanese warlord called Date, Date Masamune, who famously never showed emotion, but almost dropped uh, a Korean-made tea cup, which he particularly liked. And for the first time in his life, he showed fear. And his men were so surprised this happened, they all stared at him in horror. So he threw the, the cup to the floor and shattered it because he had shown a tiny element of weakness. But in private, the Japanese, particularly the samurai class, embraced all kinds of relationships in a very different way to the West. They didn't have that whole Christian or Roman history to deal with. They had their, only their own culture, and therefore they accepted behaviors in the same way that the ancient Greeks did. The Nanshoku relationship is very much an intimate relationship between friends who go so far that they become lovers. This homoerotic relationship doesn't necessarily go all the way to love, but it is seen as close or closer than a relationship between a man and a woman. The most interesting example, uh, the one I cite here, is a relationship that Oda, Oda Nobunaga has uh, with Mori Ranamaru. Now, interesting about that is Nobunaga is one of the greatest warlords in Japanese history. The guy was one of the most successful generals. He was utterly ruthless. He's one of the guys who basically, when the ninja took him on, wiped out an entire province that they came from to ensure that they were no threat. His team of individuals around him is a remarkable example of a very open-minded individual. He had Spanish advisors who had been brought on, obviously, as soon as they came into Japan. He invited them over, looked at maps of the world, interrogated them about European history and European culture, and very famously adopted European armor very early on. His sister, uh, Odioichi, basically is one of the, the key figures and key advisors and basically helps him with the diplomatic side. Uh, Mori Ranamaru, his lover, is a close friend, a close ally. There's Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who rises from the peasantry, right there up to being Nobunaga's successor and the second of the great unifiers of Japan. And Yasuke, who is basically a African individual, almost certainly a bodyguard of a Portuguese trader. We believe he was from Mozambique. And what happened is he arrives in Japan, he demonstrates his military skills, what, what appears to be in an ambush which Nobunaga witnessed, and he basically employs him and eventually rewards him to be a samurai. You can't think really of a more modern group than this one, where women, peasants, transgender individuals, you know, and a, a black African basically are all accepted as part of the team. And it's not surprising that Nobunaga is one of the most dangerous because of the quality of the people around him of uh, figures in Japanese history. And no one would even remotely think of criticizing any of the relationships that he has or the individuals that he accepts as part of his inner circle. After the Renaissance, and as we get more ideas from other cultures streaming in to Western culture, you begin to have a debate on whether homosexuality in itself or gender roles should be conformed as they have been in the past. Interestingly, all of the great Enlightenment figures, Descartes, Voltaire, Jeremy Bentham, all dispute the idea of social prejudice. They see it as a bad thing. They believe we should open our minds uh, to, to fresh ideas and to different perceptions. The introduction of the novel plays a very key role in this. People start to read from someone else's perception. Initially, the, the, the novel Pamela being one of the first examples, people start reading of what it's like from a woman's point of view. And by the end of the 18th century, they're reading from a slave's point of view. And it plays a massive role in the abolition of slavery. When people realize from someone else's perspective, living through in someone else's mind, through the medium of novel, they begin to change their view about judging others for their social behavior. At the same time, you've got the emergence of a whole substrata of activities. In Japan, it is the floating world. And in the West, you've got the activities, particularly in the great city of London, which is a melting pot of behaviors and cultures and characters. And you begin the emergence of the Molly Houses, this community which isn't just about sex, but is also about interaction and being in the presence of people who share your behavior, your worldview, and you feel relaxed and happy in it. And as you'll note by the picture of Hannah Snell, increasingly women are beginning to dress as men to serve in battle. 
Unlike the Scythians of the past, this is not an official behavior. When they're discovered, they're often dismissed. Uh, but those who actually excel are often rewarded and are seen as heroines for having transcended the, the traditional assumptions of society. A particular spectacular example in the late 17th century is Queen Christina of Sweden. She was the, the daughter of Gustavus Adolphus, the great Swedish general of, of the, the Thirty Years' War. Uh, she inherited the role as a child, and, but very quickly became a formidable ruler in her own right. But after a while, the whole conformity, particularly the, the Puritanism of Swedish society, another very successful Puritan society, she rebelled against this. And she felt constrained by rulership, which is a very unusual behavior, and actually resigned that position, abdicated, and actually then traveled Europe, uh, exploring, trying to understand how other societies work, and gaining a great interest uh, um, from, you know, in, in the way in which the world was changing, very much an enlightenment ruler, but in this case, one that actually gave up her power. Uh, Countess Spara was her lover. There was a lot of anger with the family about their relationship, uh, but very much uh, one which exemplifies two equal lovers, basically. Interestingly, she didn't particularly like feminine behavior or feminine lifestyles. She was very much more masculine in the way she saw the world, and, but she didn't actually resent not being a man. She just felt that somehow she wasn't particularly interested in female behaviors. Interestingly, when she finally settles in Rome, the Pope doesn't criticize or condemn her uh, for abandoning her country and her behavior. He talks, as you note here by this quote, a queen without realm, a Christian without faith, and a woman without shame. This is someone who was an atheist and yet behaved in the best way a Christian should. And therefore the Pope was in this rather difficult situation of a overt, uh, overt ex-queen, lesbian, atheist, and yet she was an exemplar of many of the behaviors the Pope wanted to encourage. So of course he naturally applauds it in a way that a medieval Pope I suspect wouldn't. A very good example within Central European history is this young prince here in 1730. Uh, his father had built up the greatest army of the era. This is the King of Prussia. And one of the, the units in it was made up entirely of men over six foot six. So an entire company of, of grenadiers, some of whom had been kidnapped from other countries because it's quite difficult to find six foot six men in this period. So this guy was slightly obsessed with the whole idea of discipline, of uniforms, you know, of, of parades. Well, when he discovers his son has a very close relationship uh, with the, one of the young officers who's been assigned to be his friend and companion, that he's infuriated by this. This is a direct rebellion, a very good example of that medieval view. As a result, they're told to break off the relationship, they both refuse, and the king loses his temper, and he, and he, he basically has the young officer executed in front of the prince. Now, he's apparently held up against the bars, so he gets to see the blood flow. And this is meant to force the boy to do exactly as he's told and to obey his father in every way. Now, you'd expect this to lead to a deeply traumatized individual, a broken individual, almost certainly an anti-military individual, someone who would see discipline and control as bad things and would either slip towards becoming a bully or basically, like Edward II, slip towards being someone who is a weak ruler and ineffectual. The result is very different. Uh, the individual... Uh, um, then goes on to be one of the most effective monarchs of the 18th century, one of the most enlightened monarchs of the 18th century, and arguably one of the greatest commanders of all time. This is a man who actually, after that experience, believes very strongly in the idea of enlightenment, in the idea of freedom, personal freedom, as we'll see later, one individual who he accepts uh, the behaviors of, even though they're slightly extravagant and over the top, those who challenge the state are accepted as part of the nature of the state. And a strong state can weather those storms. A strong state can survive that. And Frederick, even though, of course, he has to marry, uh, um, he still retains for his entire life this very, this very distant view. Admittedly, he'll, he's never going to love again. But at the same time, he is not going to allow those events to stop him from being a decent and enlightened human being. And uh, Descartes and Voltaire and others hugely admired Frederick. Voltaire personally stayed at uh, Frederick's palace on many occasions and they spoke 
and um, of course Frederick of course accepted all the criticisms that Voltaire's ma Voltaire made because he saw them as part of what made a great monarch, a, a, a remarkable figure. And a slightly more unusual and a more extreme example is one of the top spies of the mid 18th century, someone who obviously operated against Frederick uh, as, as a, one of France's top agents in the period. The Chevalier basically uh, was one of those individuals who decided that being one gender was just not enough and operated uh, wearing both men and women's clothes across the world during the period of the Seven Years' War. A very effective, very astute individual, uh, um, a, a brilliant spy, and even though it was pretty obvious to everyone around this individual, they all accepted the competence that they demonstrated. Interestingly, eventually, Louis XV insisted that they decide which gender they were, and the Chevalier decided because the wardrobe was more considerable and therefore it was more profitable, plus also I suspect that they preferred wearing a, um, a ladies' attire uh, to, to accept permanently the position as a, a lady. And as a result, the Chevalier uh, uh, died in that role. But it's interesting that, again, we've got the re-emergence of the acceptance of talent where you have non-conformity. And, and this is something that dates right the way back to the Greeks, and I think is the continuum throughout all of this early historical part of the brief. Another spectacular example is von Steuben. Basically, the, the early period of the American War of Independence, the rebellion, the Americans initially, while their men are far more experienced at fighting, a lot of the British recruits are pretty green, but trained by regular processes, the difference between a regular soldier and an effective fighter, the regular soldier would tend to win. Even though the Americans are better shots and they're more experienced, they're not used to operating as armies. And therefore, initially, the British win the early battles. And by Valley Forge, the Continental Army, Washington's army, was looking pretty wrecked. They were in a very poor condition, and therefore they thought that many more battles like the ones they'd just experienced were liable to lead to the breaking of the army. And an insurgency was just going to roll on for decades. So as a result, Washington needed a properly disciplined army. Luckily for him, during the winter at Valley Forge, they heard the tinkling of bells and a sleigh turned up. And obviously, you know, they all gathered around to find out what it was. There was a Prussian officer sitting in the back. He had two staff officers with him and two companions. And he announced to them that he was here to save them and to help them out and to turn them into soldiers. And even though this guy was clearly incredibly camp, uh, um, the Americans embraced this guy's talent. Within days, it was apparent that they had inherited an individual of remarkable skill. Frederick William von Steuben is probably one of the greatest trainers in history. He was a Prussian officer who had served with great distinction in the Seven Years' War, but he had always been slightly unusual in his behavior. Uh, um, it becomes apparent, both in the later Seven Years' War and in the American War of Independence, that when he invites cadets, those he's training, to his, off, to his house uh, for a party, there are no ladies present and everyone is told to arrive naked. This is not your usual officer, but nobody cares because this man can turn a reasonably experienced but incoherent group of men into a very effective army. And the Americans still celebrate Von Steuben Day today. They tend not to mention his outrageous behavior, uh, but the American army, when it was thinking about, you know, celebrating its, you know, the, the, the gender fluidity in the past, Von Steuben is the obvious hero to look to, and arguably is a, a very good example of don't assume that someone's behavior necessarily means that they're not talented. Von Steuben is fundamental to the history of the US military and to the US state. Without him, we almost certainly we wouldn't be looking at the America that exists today. Also within that period, with, within the Enlightenment, within this process of new ideas and new perceptions, you get a re-emergence of women fighting within the military and a re-emergence of people feeling that if we're going to get freedom, I have to fight for it too. And it's interesting, and you see this right the way from the 18th century up to the 20th, that there's an association between political rights and service in the military. And one of the reasons why you get a countering to the service of, for example, Afro-Americans, 
or um, Africans in Africa in, in the British Empire, or whether you get it in uh, the role of women or the roles of homosexuality, is if you serve, you have rights. If you have rights, you have power. So a lot of the denial of rights is about this recognition. And we find this in the written record when important individuals are looking at this and they go, we can't allow them to serve. If they serve, they will expect to vote afterwards. Uh, and this actually came up in cabinet in the First World War when they're looking at black African soldiers. And the South Africans pointed out, if we give black African soldiers service roles, they will expect the vote. So they were allowed to be porters, they were allowed to dig trenches, but they were not allowed to serve in combat units. Interestingly, when there were colonial troops, uh, um, part of the, the policing process, like the King's African Rifles, that was no problem because they were already in a military role and all that had done is extended into their role as part of the British Empire defending itself. But mobilizing communities that were not normally accepted was seen as dangerous. And this is a very important uh, dynamic to understand. Interestingly, the French Revolution and Napoleon's code decriminalized homosexuality. They don't necessarily embrace it within the military, but they certainly, it's the beginning of the legalization process. Interestingly, as soon as the war ended, Napoleon was defeated, uh, the Holy Alliance uh, reverses many of these, but this is the beginning of a process. From now on, things like slavery, uh, um, things like gender inequality are gradually going to recede because the Enlightenment is going to push them out of existence. And we should recognize the importance of the Enlightenment in that process. Interestingly, when you're again looking at that Roman example earlier, if you look at the Royal Navy, when you do get the rare occasions when you get somebody indicted for homosexuality, and it's incredibly rare in the Royal Navy, there's, there's little doubt that, the, you know, if you look in the percentage terms, there were many more than were punished for it. The suggestion is, is that it only occurs where it disrupts discipline, where it undermines the relationship between the ranks and it undermines the structure of the military society within the, the warship, which is a very close, confined environment, and therefore you have to be very careful how these behaviours are controlled. And any sexuality on a Royal Naval ship is condemned or seen as unacceptable if it disrupts discipline. Interestingly, there was a British officer indicted uh, for raping a sailor in this period, and black sailors actually were among the witnesses against him and their testimony is seen as equal to all the others because the Royal Navy is a meritocratic system and it is about the success of the ship's company and it's not confined by assumptions about gender or society or culture it's about does this fighting ship work effectively and as a result there's more acceptance I suspect than would appear in the normal historical record. The American Civil War is an interesting case. Uh, you, again, you get the examples you get uh, elsewhere in the historical record of women serving in the military. There's a lovely picture here of Pauline Cushman posing after the war in Union uniform, and there were quite a few women, and we have many photographs of them uh, dressed up in, in, in military uniform and clearly serving in both armies, often covertly. But also there is the issue about homosexuality. Again, millions of troops uh, were deployed and yet we only have six indictments for the entire American Civil War. And this is utterly implausible in terms of percentage and one suspects that actually the, the, uh, these sort of behaviors were broadly speaking accepted as long as they weren't prejudicial to discipline. This lovely photograph here, the, these two gentlemen are smoking each other's cigar. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that is meant to uh, describe, but I'm quite sure there's some deeper meaning to it, but it's suspected by modern historians to be a representation of their very close relationship. Interestingly, after the war and up until the point when homosexuality actually appears in the dictionary, it doesn't appear until the 1890s in America, uh, um, they're not dishonorably discharged when this sort of thing is discovered in peacetime. Interestingly, peacetime is much more anti-homosexual than wartime. And it's always described as fraudulent enlistment because they have enlisted under the false pretense that they're going to you know, serve as a, as a man uh, um, rather than dishonorable discharge because again, it's not judged as harshly as it does as society begins to get a little bit more sensitive about some of these behaviors. So again, history doesn't necessarily go in a flow upwards. It is sometimes uh, more open-minded, more benevolent, sometimes more regressive uh, and, and, and more sort of judgmental or autocratic. A spectacular example uh, um, of, of, of gender fluidity and is in the Crimean War. 
there are suggestions of Florence Nightingale, may or may not have been homosexual, but one person who definitely is spectacular is Dr. James Barry. Uh, Barry served as a junior doctor around throughout the middle of the century, uh, and was uh, attained very high rank. Uh, uh, he was definitely a uh, rose to one star brigadier general, basically, during the period. Uh, was highly regarded, uh, developed many innovations, uh, um, and highly respected in the army. Uh, and then he died, and it turned out he wasn't a chap after all. Now, even though it then became apparent that Dr. James Barry had been a, a lady all the time, Nobody went back and condemned this. They all went, what a remarkable achievement to have got away with this. I suspect that many people knew and that basically the Barry's skill was enough to justify uh, um, continued service. Interestingly, Barry does not describe himself as a woman dressed as a man. From the way in which Barry describes himself or himself or herself in the post-war period, it's apparent that it's probably transgender, uh, um, as opposed to a woman dressed as a man, which is many of the other examples earlier on. Of. So it's quite an interesting case study, and one that I hasn't really been fully understood, and there's yet to be a really good biography of, and would be an interesting case study. By the First World War, the, the homosexuality is beginning to become more accepted. Uh, um, the, obviously a service in all nations, some of whom are overt, but the vast majority are accepted as part of the military system. Nobody questions this. We're talking about an existential war. No one's going to waste time judging you on your, on your social behaviours while you know, your entire society is threatened with destruction. Interesting, you also start to get the role of women now becoming more overt less disguised. Uh, two spectacular examples from the Eastern Front, uh, Katerina Te Teodoru in particular, uh, uh, obviously uh, accepted her commission clearly as a woman, commanded troops clearly as a woman, and was a very effective officer, and was killed in battle, and died continuing to issue commands to her company uh, during one of Romania's uh, rare victories against the Germans, a very effective young officer and held up by the Romanians quite rightly as an exemplar of officer behavior. The Russians, when they became desperate, uh, um, recognized that they could recruit from across society and started to form uh, battalions of women initially to do uh, work behind the lines. But when it became apparent that there were women dedicated to Russia's victory and who obviously were clearly potentially loyal to the regime, they formed the, the so-called battalions of death. Interestingly, the royal palaces were protected by them, but they also served in frontline combat, uh, um, conducting frontal assaults against the German army who were understandably horrified uh, but respected uh, the bravery of the individuals who fought. Very much uh, elite units in terms of their enthusiasm and fervor for battle. It's a particularly uh, um, interesting photograph of uh, one of the units and note the medals uh, worn by all the individuals in the photograph. So there are two ideas I want to get across with my part of the presentation. The first is that war and the military created gay culture as we know it. And the second is that in turn, queer people have defined how we think about war and the military. So this part of the story begins with a shift in thinking from buggery is bad to homosexuals are bad. So people weren't thought of as being gay so much as particular acts were punished for being homosexual. Enter fledgling psychiatry or quackery, you might say. This chap, John Martin Sharko, the father of neuro neurology, I uh, decided that homosexuality was a mental illness uh, like hysteria and epilepsy, the gateway drug of moral degeneracy. So hysteria, that pathological condition of being born a woman. So zero for three there. And to this point where the sodomite had been a temporary aberration, Charco invented the concept of the homosexual as a species, uh, one that was considered to be mentally ill. So enter mass mobilization. We can't send mentally ill people to war. In the UK, our attitude was relatively tolerant. If you didn't get caught doing it, the army by necessity would mostly turn a blind eye. What tended to happen was that people had to really cross a line. So some other infraction would be dealt with harshly because they were known to be homosexual. Or if the liaison crossed class boundaries, so an officer with a rating, then it would become an issue that had to be dealt with because it was undermining authority and discipline. The US was much less forgiving. So their World War II army were segregated and they had a systemic screening process to identify gays at the draft board based on some fairly ridiculous criteria. Uh, so obviously gay men don't have a gag reflex. That's how they do all that oral sex. So that's how they screened out gay men. And they obviously had a 100% success rate. They didn't miss anyone and there were no false positives. 
and suspected homosexuals were given a blue discharge. And this backfired pretty spectacularly. First of all, they made a lot of men aware of their sexual, sexual orientation. And then they saw their peers practicing situational homosexuality on deployment. And it kind of normalized same-sex behavior somewhat. Secondly, married women and pregnant women were not allowed to enlist. So a disproportionate number of lesbians served during World War II to the point that it became a self-fulfilling prophecy where women signed up because they expected to find other lesbians there. Uh, third, the blue discharge was a really public outing at a time when that meant social ostracism. So there were huge numbers of gay men that couldn't or didn't go home. And they tried to make a fresh start whether, wherever they had been discharged. And very quickly, there were large and visible gay communities in port cities like San Francisco, LA, and New York. And by the time we get to Vietnam, people are realizing that if you don't want to go to war, there's a foolproof way to get out. Anti-war slogans included suck cock, beat the draft, and there were pamphlets written about how to pass as a hoaxer sexual. So Jimi Hendrix got himself discharged within a week by claiming homosexuality and an addiction to masturbation. What was also happening during Vietnam was that people were meeting black soldiers and thinking, well, if black people are demanding civil rights, maybe gays should be doing the same. So by this time, there was something like 100,000 disenfranchised gay veterans, and they start speaking up. So this guy is Leonard Matlovich, and he voluntarily served three tours in Vietnam. In part, he hoped to die during war to not have to deal with the shame and stigma of his homosexuality. So he put himself into danger time and time again, and he was awarded the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart for his behavior. And one day he snapped and he wrote to his CEO, I'm gay, and you'll make an exception because of my exemplary record, right? And the CEO says, nah, tear this up or forget it ever happened. But Matlovich refused, and he was given a less than honorable discharge, which he protested until his death. Meanwhile, in Britain, uh, we had a pretty similar outlook in terms of sodomy is a crime until the shift towards mental illness as an explanation in the 1880s-ish. So in 1885, we replaced the death penalty for buggery, which was catching straight couples as well as gay couples, and replaced it with the blackmailers charter. And this made any male homosexual act illegal and no witnesses were required. So just writing a letter to a man could get you prosecuted. In 1921, Parliament decided not to add lesbianism to the criminal law because they feared it would encourage women to try it out. So then the Holocaust happens and 50,000 gay men are imprisoned by the Nazis and they're given a pink triangle to distinguish them from the Jews who wore yellow stars. And they were the lowest of the low in the camp hierarchy. And when we liberated the concentration camps, the gays were not freed. And when Nazism was dismantled, the anti-LGBT laws were the only bit left in place. And there's literally no record of how many queer people were killed during the Holocaust because the narrative has been sanitized to emphasize the virtuous and righteous victims, embracing the LGBT victims. And surprise, modern day Nazism has gone straight for LGBT rights again with a ban on trans soldiers and bathroom bills. So one forward 35 years and the AIDS crisis hits. In the UK, we have the Don't Die of Ignorance campaign. And in the US, the campaign is led by the Gay Liberation Front, who repurposed the Pink Triangle as a direct reference to AIDS as a gay holocaust. So before there was the pride flag, the symbol of the gay community was the Pink Triangle, upside down, compared to how the Nazis used it. So back to the 1950s, and the relatively permissive attitude of don't get caught during World War I and World War II disappears in the Cold War. So we've moved from this idea, if we can't have mentally ill people at war, to gay people are a security risk. They're an insidious threat that has to be weeded out. And there were literally the gay police looking for any sign that you might be gay, including witch hunts to find Dorothy, who was obviously the ringleader. And for those of you who don't know, Are You a Friend of Dorothy was code to identify yourself to other queer people without outing yourself to unsuspecting straight people. And the Women's Royal Air Force kept a secret list of the women they thought but couldn't prove were gay. And if you were on this list, uh, you were under constant surveillance, uh, subject to a quarterly check with the police. And there was a special screening process for any applications you made. And the lesbian index was still in force into the late 90s. So then late 50s, the Wolfender report says that homosexuality probably isn't a mental illness and some gay activity is decriminalized. That is gay sex between two men over 21 behind a locked door, the curtains drawn and nobody else in the house. Uh, at this time, the age of consent for straight couples was 16. So it sounds like a leap forward, 
but actually the relaxed law was enforced more aggressively. 400 men were convicted of gross indecency, so that's having sex, in the year before the ban was lifted, and over 1,200 men were convicted the year after. And also the unnatural offences anti-gay laws weren't repealed, so it remained a criminal offence for two men to touch, kiss, loiter with homosexual intent. Uh, so men were literally going to jail for winking well into the 90s. Uh, men and women were being uh, charged with gross indecency for same-sex kissing or cuddling in public. So it wasn't until 1991 that you could be gay and have access to top secret material. In 1994, it ceased to be illegal for members of the armed forces to do the things that the 1967 Act legalised for civilians. So that's gay sex between consenting adults over 21 in private. So in, in 2000, we allowed queer people to serve openly in the military. But until 2017, homosexual acts themselves still constituted grounds for dismissal. So being gay could still get you thrown out even though you were legally allowed to serve. I think what's been the most shocking revelation for me is that chaplains were regularly snitching on service personnel's confessions of queerness. You know, that legally protected confidentiality where Catholic priests will refuse to call the police when they hear about a crime and refuse to get medical help when someone is suicidal. But for queers, I guess we make an exception. Um, of course, I've always been queer people in the military. Uh, this guy, Brian Hurst, uh, one of the directors of this film and many others said, some people have asked whether I'm bisexual. In fact, I am trisexual. The army, the navy, and the household cavalry. Uh, he lived close to the barracks, and many a guardsman willingly presented themselves to, at his house for active service. There was Gladys, the completely over-the-top, extravagantly gay male nurse at a field hospital, adored by everyone. He made no secret, secret of his homosexuality, uh, and he was accepted because he was such a marvellous nurse. There was Freddie, a coder on a destroyer, his action station was to relay the captain's orders to the forward guns. So when the captain said, open fire, Freddie repeated, open fire, dears. And he was immensely popular with the crew because they found it so funny and because he wrote letters home for the illiterate sailors. Uh, there was Winston. Somerset Maud once said, Winston, your mother often indicated that you had affairs in your youth with men. Not true, he said, but I once went to bed with a man to see what it was like. Who was it? Ivan Novello. And what was it like? Musical, he replied. So that was code word at the time for being gay. You might have heard of this man. Staff Sar Sergeant Eric Alva was the first US casualty of the Iraq war. So he was out to his immediate family, but nothing outside that. And he went to great lengths to keep it that way, even buying a framed photograph of a woman to keep on his nightstand. And he said, it's an interesting story, the intersectionality of my life. I'm a gay man. I'm a United States Marine. I'm also disabled and Hispanic. And it was his military oath that made him decide to testify before Congress for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And he said that at 19, when I took that oath to defend the country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, it meant every single walk of life. That meant every individual, whether male, female, young, old, gay, straight, black, white, Hispanic, able-bodied, disabled. Those rights don't belong to just the selected few. There was Roy in the RAF, gay as Caesar's camp. Uh, and there was an incident in which a senior officer made an offensive remark about Roy in the mess and uh, a blazing row ensued. Another officer came to his defense and shouted at the senior officer, he's got more guts in his arsehole than you have in your whole body. It must go you to have men like him on your squadrons with DSOs and DFCs and DFMs, while all you've got is a little piece of lettuce leaf for shooting up the bleeding Arabs, sir. Uh, and actually this flight into masculinity is what makes queer people such good soldiers. So boys who've been growing up being told not to be so such a sissy go for the most masculine job they can find. And for gay and trans people, their body is a source of shame. So they'll lean into extreme physicality. I hate my body, punish it, punish me. So Kristen Beck served 20 years as a Navy SEAL under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and then transitioned after her retirement. And she volunteered for each of her 13 deployments out of a desire to die honorably so she wouldn't have to wrestle with the emotional pain of the incongruity between her gender identity and her body. So here she is on the right, a woman disguised as a seal who grew a beard to disguise himself as a Pashtun. And she's probably the only woman to have sat at the head of a meal with Mujahideen commanders. 
so there's Kitchener. Uh, so he never married. He lived with a younger male colleague for many years and in his spare time, he enjoyed flower arranging. So the chap without a hat, that is Captain Oswald Fitzgerald. Uh, and he was referred to rather insultingly as Kitchener's familiar by the PM, Herbert Asquith. So Fitz and Kitchener died together in 1916 when HMS Hampshire was struck a mine. Fitz's body was recovered, but Kitchener's was never found. And the public reaction to Kitchener's death was on a par with the death of Princess Diana. What have the gays ever done for us? Well, Kitchener invented the seamless knitted stock. So you have him to thank for that. So this is the Reverend Samuel Lawton Green, MC Bar. Uh, and the notes from his intake interview are top left, and you'll see at the bottom uh, noted, very mincing manner, like Bristow. So Bristow was a uh, chaplain at Aldershot Garrison at the time, and he was a friend of Lord Kitchener, noted for his effeminacy. Um, at the time that Green uh, volunteered, very few chaplains went to the front line, but he had his own dugout in the trenches with a sign saying the vicarage. Uh, one day, a soldier new to the trenches came across this and remarked to his friend, Call cool, blimey, Bill, who'd have thought of seeing the bloody vicarage at the front line? And at this, Green popped his head out and said, yes, and who'd have thought of seeing the bloody vicar too? So Easter Sunday, 1917, Green was shelled while conducting communion, and the next morning, the Battle of Arras began, and for the next 48 hours, with shrapnel still in his legs, he was tending the wounded at the advanced dressing station and going out into the battlefield with the stretcher parties. He was twice awarded the Military Cross. Uh, the citation for the second award was for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty. During the advance, he attended the wounded frequently under fire. He went forward and stayed for over an hour with a badly wounded signaller lying out in the open under shell fire until the stretcher bearers could fetch him away. So uh, bottom right, there he is pictured in War Illustrated, mentioned in dispatches. Next to him is Canon James Coop, who covered himself in glory at the Somme and then returned to Liverpool Cathedral. And his daughter, Helen Coop, went on to become a Watu Wren. So was Green Gay? It's really hard to tell. His gender expression was definitely not what was expected from a straight man. And he was associated with presumed homosexuals. He never married at a time when Anglican clergy were permitted to. And although he was high church, so may have seen celibacy as a religious requirement in keeping with the Catholic tradition, other curates at his Norfolk church did marry. But regardless of his sexuality, he demonstrated that an effeminate presentation has no bearing on your ability to be courageous under fire. This is Tupi May Laufer. She declined to fence in a skirt on the grounds of practicality. In 1898, she entered a fencing competition at the Older Garrison, where she beat all the ladies and then went on to beat the army sergeant instructor as well. In 1917, she petitioned General Pétain, we should be allowed to do frontline work under the same conditions as the men, and he agreed, and her 20-vehicle ambulance unit was incorporated into the French army, and she was made a lieutenant. And they were heavily involved in the Battle at Campagne in June 1918, and advanced with the First Army into Germany. They were twice mentioned in dispatches, and Laufer was awarded the Cree de Guerre. Contemporaries described her as a hermaphrodite, and she tells the story of how, while motoring, she was stopped at the Franco-Italian border for masquerading as a man. On the return journey, she wore a skirt, and she was arrested for masquerading as a woman. This is the founder of the commando, Dudley Clark. He escaped from a Spanish jail in 1941, dressed as a woman. Guy Little of MI5 was unimpressed. He was dressed as a woman, complete with brassier. What on earth was the blighter thinking of? Chap might go in disguise if needed, but in a brassier. So there's a huge tradition of cross-dressing and trans and queerness in special forces and spying, partly because this is a group of people who are really good at pretending to be someone they're not and living a double life and being able to compartmentalise things that they get up to. This is Nancy Spain. She was a broadcaster, a journalist, game show panelist, and a rather successful sportswoman, kind of the Sandy Tox figure of World War II. And during the war, she was a Wren, and she began as a driver, but was promoted to second officer and put in charge of Anson Division at the Wren Officer Training Course. So she had a hand in training pretty much every Wren who made officer from 1943 onwards, and she made no secret of her homosexuality. And after the war, she wrote 
uh, magazine articles in the style of Blue Peter presented challenges. So she'd go rock climbing and rally driving, uh, operate a dock on crane. And she lived openly with her partner, the founder of and editor of She Magazine, Joan Werner Laurie. Major Alan Rogers died in Operation Desert Shield as an openly gay man under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, and his death in Iraq caused something of a controversy when the Pentagon attempted to straight wash details of his sexuality from Wikipedia. The New Yorker magazine published a lengthy profile of Rogers and the larger issues surrounding Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, and that's where the illustration on the left comes from. Uh, the story quotes Colonel Mike Hardy, who worked with Major Rogers at the Pentagon, saying, he did not make any moves to be remembered as a gay soldier. Nowhere in those phone calls home did he say, let everyone know that I died a proud gay officer. And Ben McGrath, the author of the article, then comments, of course, being a proud gay officer is tantamount under the current military policy to being a retired gay officer with no pension. So Rogers expressed his opinion on Don't Ask, Don't Tell in his master's thesis written in 2005, shortly before his deployment. Today's current policy on gays in the military seems to rest on many false assumptions, namely that homosexuals will jeopardise unit cohesiveness. My research has been unable to justify that position and has found that the opposite is more true. Denying service members the right to serve freely and openly violates basic dignity and respect of the human experience and puts our national security at risk. This is Wing Commander Ian Gleed. Battle of Britain ace with DSO and DFC. One of his pilots wrote, I flew with Ian a lot and due to him, I probably survived the war. He was a great inspiration to us all, entirely unselfish and very brave. I've never known a better loved commanding officer. He had a big heart and seemed not to have any fear. He was unmovable and unflappable with a modest, unassuming manner. And when Ian wrote his memoir, A Rise to Conquer, his publishers insisted that he include a fictional girlfriend for the sake of appearances. So the military has always been full of queer people, but actually military culture is full of queer culture. So Polari is a language used in gay culture, particularly by camp men up till the 1960s. So people like Kenneth Williams and Round the Horn was famously full of many in jokes in Polari that got past the censors because straight people had no idea how rude they really were. Uh, and this language was used for speaking in front of outsiders without risking jail or uh, worse. So it has three roots. One of them is Pali Ali, which is a language spoken by travelers, Roma, circus people, merchants and migrant workers. And it was kind of the Esperanto of the 18th century for people on the edges of society. And it was thieves cant, a secret language used by disreputable types for speaking in front of outsiders, particularly in front of the law. And what happens is that mollies, being queer and gender non-conforming men, get sent to jail and they take Pali Ali with them and they bring back thieves cant. And then the third route is that some of these criminals are conscripted into the army as part of their sentencing, and they bring back words from the campaigns in France and India and the Middle East. So then the traveling shows start to find a home in the music halls and drag acts and dancers and entertainers all find themselves under the same roof as sailors working the backstage rigging and uh, Polari is born out of the gay subculture in London's music halls. And then you get two world wars, and conscription and ENSA bringing Polari back into military slang. So some words of Polari you may know. Uh, news to me, NAF is actually an acronym. And it's not just queer slang. Queer people have defined how we think about war and the military. Bottom left, Walt Whitman, male nurse in the Civil War. Oh, captain, my captain. Not pictured, Rudyard Kipling, his contribution to the war effort was the epitaph, a soldier of the great war known unto God. Also not pictured, Ivan Novello, keep the home fires burning. Top left, Wilfred Owen, Dolce et Decorum Est, and probably every other World War I poem you know, except maybe some corner of a foreign field. That was Rupert Brooke at bottom right. In the middle is Siegfried Sassoon, he was Owen's lover. He wrote Everyone Sang. Top right is Major Mike O'Donnell, a uh, Vietnam War poet, he wrote what's become the US go-to remembrance poem, If You Are Able. And these are just the well-known poets. Uh, there's also films. Uh, Target for Tonight had a gay director in which we serve. Noel Coward, he's gay, wrote uh, and played the lead. Zero Dark Thirty had a lesbian producer. Where Eagles Dare, Richard Burton was openly queer. 
and there's also flare path went the day well the spy who came in from the cold zulu run silent run deep bridge over the river kwai we dive at dawn and uh, i could go on these are still just the big names uh, and the the openly queer people so queer people have been uh key to defining how we feel about war they're also key to how we define war so t.e lawrence had no attraction to women uh in Syria in 1911, he formed a very close friendship with an Arab called Dahoum. Were they just friends? Well, he sculpted a naked statue of Dahoum for his garden, and it's probable that his reconnaissance behind enemy lines in 1917 was an attempt to visit his friend. And there's considerable evidence that he was a masochist. Uh, he paid a military colleague to administer beatings, and he liked taking severe tests of fitness and stamina. So again, with that flight into hypermasculinity and a desire to punish the body that doesn't fit heteronormative expectations. So Lawrence codified the principles of guerrilla warfare in a series of papers. Something else we have to thank him for, when he died in 1935 in a motorcycle crash, the doctor who attended him, Hugh Kearns, began a long study of loss of life by motorcycle dispatch riders through head injuries, and this led directly to the introduction of crash helmets. The Western Approaches Tactical Unit, you may know them from our other work. Two of the Wrens, uh, Second Officer Nan Wales on the left and Second Officer Jean Laidlaw next to her were both gay. Wales was a formidable tennis badminton and hockey player and she became a PE teacher after the war and never married. So ticking all those good stereotypical boxes. Laidlaw we know a bit more about. So between the wars, World War I Wrens were disbanded and they saw the Girl Guides as a training ground for a new generation of Wrens should they be needed so Vera Lawton Matthews who was to be the director of Wrens during World War II formed a Sea Ranger unit in London and Laidlaw was one of her girls for the 1937 Jubilee rally the Sea Rangers put on a demonstration of a breaches boy rescue so that's a ship to shore or ship to ship rescue technique where a line carrying rocket is fired over the stricken vessel the rope is tied off about the mast and used as a zip line to ferry off the crew and the breeches boy is a life belt with a pair of trousers sewn into it to be used as a harness. So they did a live firing demonstration complete with a pirate ship wrecked in the middle of Wembley Stadium. And Laidlaw was one of these sea rangers. And there was a man in the audience who could hardly keep a seat for excitement. And he was overheard to say, my goodness, if women can do things like this, how can so many be content with the fripperies they are? Laidlaw studied maths. And when war broke out, she was working as an insurance clerk. After the war, she became one of the first female chartered accountants, and she lived openly with her partner, Beryl, uh, in the 60s and 70s. So she joined the Wrens, and she was working as a clerk at Wren HQ under Lawton Matthews until 1942. Britain stands alone in Europe. At the rate we're losing shipping, we've got three months of food and raw materials left before we're starved out of the war. And Churchill says to Captain Roberts, find out what's happening in the Atlantic, find out how to sink the U-boats, and find out how to get our convoys through. So Roberts is handed four wrens, Liz Drake, Jean Laidlaw, Bobby Howes, and Nan Wales. And they're given this problem. Suppose a ship in your convoy is torpedoed. Where was the U-boat? Conventional wisdom said they were attacking from outside the convoy. So the tactic of the day was to turn outwards and uh, search with illuminance. So they used Fred Jane's fighting ship rules to plot out the action on the floor with players behind screens only able to view the action through peepholes that rendered the U-boat tracks invisible. And by this, they were able to establish that the U-boats are operating inside the convoys. So they'd get inside the escort screen, fire off a spread of torpedoes at short range, and then they'd go deep inside and let the convoy leave them behind. So Watu devised a tactic of all the escorts heading to the rear of the convoy and trawling up the U-boat with Asdick. What should we call this tactic, asks Admiral Percy Noble, CNC Western Approaches, and Laidlaw replies, Raspberry, because <coughs> to her Hitler. The Watu game is remarkable for being both an analytic tool for understanding enemy tactics and devising counter tactics, and a training tool for teaching convoy operations to escort officers. Watu trained 5,000 officers from literally every country except the Axis countries, and their tactics remained relevant into the Cold War. So some of the uh, Royal Navy officers who took part in our 2018 recreation of the game had been taught Watu tactics as part of their Royal Navy training. <laughs>
another Watu Ren, not gay, but definitely gender non-conforming, was poached from Watu to become chief plotter at Gibraltar, crossing the Med in 1943. The previous team of Wrens had been torpedoed and drowned, so Howes was sent across the Med on board a destroyer, and she carried out duties as midshipman of the watch during that voyage. So women have been in frontline combat roles for a lot longer than you imagine, and a lot longer than the rules say they should have been. In conclusion, queer people were present at every significant military event. In fact, queer people have been instrumental in every significant military campaign. And actually, war and the military created gay culture as we know it. And in turn, queer culture has shaped the military and shaped how the nation and the world thinks about war and conflict. They've been a vital and accepted part of military life since long before any of the bans were put in place or were lifted. And queer people from across the entire spectrum, from in the closet to absolutely fabulous, have been excellent soldiers and proof that how you dress and speak and love and carry yourself has basically nothing to do with your ability to be courageous under fire on the battlefield or in the back room. And that LGBT rights and acceptance in the military and society has been a bit more of a roller coaster, bouncing around between outright hostility and it's fine. Particular favourite seems to be we'll put up with this as long as you're discreet and exceptionalism so we'll ignore that about you because we need you or because you're very good at your job and these are two tropes common to all kinds of discrimination and it's all about centering that straight white male perspective and giving them the power to police what's acceptably queer and gender non-conforming or what's not and some of the most virulent anti-lgbt sentiment from the military and veterans uh, is centered around remembrance and the idea that there were queer soldiers and that they should be honored alongside straight soldiers for their contribution and their sacrifice during war. And that is it.